Book Two, Chapter One, Part Two of History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One, by Henry Charles Lee. Book Two, Chapter One Relations with the Crown. Part Two. It was inevitable that, when this powerful personality was withdrawn, the royal control over the Inquisition would diminish, especially in view of the inability of Queen Juana to govern and the absence of the youthful Charles V. The government of Spain practically devolved upon Jiménez, who was Inquisitor-General of Castile, while his coadjutor Adrian speedily obtained the same post in Aragon, after the arrival of Charles and the death of Jiménez, Adrian became chief of the reunited Inquisition, and his influence over Charles in all matters connected with it was unbounded. The circumstances, therefore, were peculiarly propitious for the development of its practical independence, although, theoretically, the supremacy of the crown remained unaltered. Thus, the Suprema, of which we hear little under Ferdinand, at once assumed his place in regulating all details. The appointing power, even of receivers, who were secular officials, accountable only to the royal treasury, passed into its hands. Thus, a letter of Jimenez, March 11, 1517, to a receiver of Toledo, states that there are large amounts of uncollected confiscations, Wherefore, he is directed to select a proper person for an assistant, and send him to the Suprema to decide as to his fitness, so that Jimenez may appoint him with its approval. Still, the nominating power remained technically with the crown, and when Charles arrived, he was assumed to exercise it as Ferdinand had done, however little real volition he may have displayed. In a letter of December 11th, 1518, concerning the appointment of André Sánchez de Torquemada as Inquisitor of Seville, Charles is made to say that, being satisfied of Torquemada's capacity, he had charged him to accept the office, and that with his assent Adrian had appointed him. In another case, where an abbot to whom Adrian had offered the Inquisitorship of Toledo had declined the office, Charles writes, September 14, 1519, charging him to accept it. That Adrian could not act alone was recognized, for after Charles left Spain in May 1520, questions arose on the subject, and by letters patent of September 12, he formally empowered Adrian, during his absence, to appoint all inquisitors and other officials. Whether formal delegations of the appointing power were subsequently made does not appear, but practically it continued with the Inquisitor-General, subject to an uncertain cooperation of the Suprema, whose members countersigned the commissions, while, with the subordinate positions in the tribunals, the Inquisitors were sometimes consulted, their recommendations received attention, and their remonstrances were heard. The various factors are illustrated in a letter of the Suprema, August 24, 1544, to the inquisitors of Saragossa, who had furnished a statement of the qualifications of various aspirants for the vacant post of Notario del Juzgado. In reply, the Suprema states that its secretary, Jerónimo Surita, had recommended Martín Morales. It had advised with the inquisitor-general who had appointed him, but it will bear in mind Bartolome Malo, and we will give him something else. As far as I am aware, Philip II never interfered with this exercise of the appointing power. That he threw the whole responsibility on the Inquisitor-General, and disclaimed any concurrence for himself is apparent in a series of instructions, May 8, 1595, to the new Inquisitor-General, Geronimo Manrique, he orders him to observe the utmost care to select fit persons for all positions without favoritism, and, although it is his duty to appoint inquisitors and fiscals, 
he should communicate his selections in advance to the Suprema, as his predecessors had always done, because some of the members may be acquainted with the parties and prevent errors from being made. That a supervisory power, however, was still recognized in the crown is seen in a consulta of June 21, 1600, presented to Philip III by Inquisitor General Guevara, lamenting the unfitness of many of the inquisitors. With the habitual tenderness manifested to unworthy officials, he did not propose to dismiss them, but to make a general shifting by which the best men should be made the seniors of the tribunals. To this, the king replied with a caution about discrediting the Inquisition, and a suggestion that the parties shifted should be made to ask for the change. He also called for their names and the reasons, because he ought to be informed about all the individuals. This indicated a desire to resume the close watchfulness of Ferdinand, which had long since been forgotten in the turmoil and absences of Charles V and the secluded labors of Philip II, over dispatches and consultas. A bureaucracy was establishing itself in which the various departments of the government were becoming more or less independent of the monarch, and Philip, for the moment, appeared disposed to reassert his authority, for, in 1603, we are told that he made many appointments of inquisitors, fiscals, and even of minor officials. If so, he was too irresolute, feeble, and fitful to carry out a definite line of policy for when, in 1608, he issued the customary instructions to a new inquisitor, Sandoval y Rojas, he merely repeated the injunctions of 1595, with the addition that transfers should also be communicated to the Suprema. Yet, in one case, he even exceeded Ferdinand by intervening in a case of faith. When he went to Toledo with his court to witness the Ato de Fe of May 10th, 1615, he asked to see the sentence of Juan Cote, penanced for Lutheranism, and made some changes in the Meritos, or Recital of Offenses altered the imprisonment to perpetual and irremissible, and added two hundred lashes. The tribunal consulted the Suprema, which approved the changes on the supposition that the Inquisitor General had participated in them. But the day after the auto, Cote was informed that the Suprema had mercifully remitted the scourging. Philip IV, in 1626, on the death of Inquisitor General Pacheco, asked the Suprema to suggest the instructions to be given to the new incumbent, and was advised to repeat those of 1608. He virtually admitted the power of appointment to be vested in that office when, in the same year, the Cortes of Barbastro petitioned that in Aragon all the officials of the tribunals should be Aragonese, and he replied that he would use his authority with the Inquisitor General that a certain portion of them should be so. Notwithstanding his habitual subservience to the Inquisition, however, he reserted his prerogative in 1640 by appointing the Archdeacon of Vic as Inquisitor of Barcelona, and he followed this, in 1641 and 1642, by several others, even descending to the secretaryship of Lima, which he gave to Domingo de Aroche. This brought on a struggle, ending in a compromise in which the Inquisitor General was sacrificed to the Suprema. Papal intervention was deemed to be necessary, and a brief was procured on March 1643, under which Philip, by decree of July 2nd, ordered that in future, in all vacancies of positions of Inquisitor and Fiscal, the Inquisitor General and Suprema should submit to him three names from which to make a selection. The Suprema, thus recognized, was satisfied. But Sotomayor, the Inquisitor General, was obstinate. In June, Philip had called for his resignation, which he offered after some hesitation, and expressed his feelings in a protest, presenting a sorry picture of the condition of the Holy Office. The present disorders, he said, 
had arisen from the multiplication of offices, whereby their character had depreciated, and, as the revenues were insufficient for their support, they were led to improper devices. The Suprema had been powerless, for, on various occasions, the king had rewarded services in other fields by the gifts of these offices, when no consideration could be given to character, and he had also been forced to make appointments by commands as imperative as those of the king, an evident allusion to Olivares. Sotomayor's successor, Arce y Reynoso, conformed himself to these new rules, and, until his death in 1665, he submitted all appointments and transfers to the king. Philip survived him but three months, and under the regency which followed, and the reign of the imbecile Carlos II, the inquisitor general resumed the power of appointment without consultation. So completely was the royal supervision forgotten that the instructions to Inquisitor General Rocaberti in 1695 repeat the old formula of 1608. In this, the injunction of consulting the Suprema was displeasing to the Holy See after its intervention in the affair of Froilan Diaz, of which more hereafter, had caused it to take sides in a quarrel over the respective powers of the Inquisitor General and the Suprema. As the commission of the former was a papal grant, it held that no restriction could be placed on him, and, when Vidal Marin was appointed, Clement XI sent to him, August 8, 1705, urgent instructions to uphold the dignity of his office which had exclusive authority in the premises. The command was too agreeable not to be obeyed, and from this time the unrestricted power of appointment was in the hands of the Inquisitor General. About 1765, a writer tells us that all salaried offices were filled by him alone. If the king wished to gratify someone with a position, he would signify his desire to the Inquisitor General that such a person should be borne in mind at the first vacancy, and the royal wish was respected in the absence of special objection. If such there were, it was reported to the king and his decision was awaited. With the tendency to assert the prerogative under Carlos III, this was called in question in 1775, when the royal Camara scrutinized the brief commissioning Felipe Bertran as Inquisitor General, but the protest was merely formal, the appointing power remained undisturbed, it survived the revolution and continued until the Inquisition was suppressed. Of vastly greater importance was the power of selecting and virtually dismissing the Inquisitor General, and this the crown never lost. In fact, this was essential to its dignity, if not to its safety. Had the appointment rested with the Pope, either the Inquisition would of necessity have been reduced to insignificance, or the kingdom would have become a dependency of the Curia. Had the Suprema possessed the power of presenting a nominee to the Pope, the Inquisition would have become an independent body, rivaling, and perhaps in time, superseding the monarchy. Yet, after the death of Ferdinand, Cardinal Adrian, when elected to the papacy, seemed to imagine that Ferdinand's privilege of nomination had been merely personal, and that it had reverted to him. February 19, 1522 he wrote to Charles that a successor must be provided. After much thought, he had pitched on the Dominican general, but had not determined to make the appointment without first learning Charles's wishes. If the Dominican was not satisfactory, Charles would name someone else, for which purpose he suggested three other prelates. Charles replied from Brussels, March 29th, assuming the appointment to be in his hands but ordered his representative Lachau to confer with Adrian. He was in no haste to reach a decision, and it was not until July 13, 1523, that he instructed his ambassador, the Duke of Sesa, to ask for commission for Alfonso Manrique, Bishop of Cordova, on whom he had conferred the post of Inquisitor-General and the Archbishopric of Seville. 
the records afford no indication of any question subsequently arising as to the power of the crown to select the inquisitor general it was never however officially recognized by the popes whose commissions to the successive nominees bore the form of muto proprio the spontaneous act of the holy see by which without reference to any request from the sovereign the recipient was created inquisitor general of the spanish dominions and was invested with all the faculties and powers requisite for the functions of his office no objection seems to have been taken to this until carlos the third exercised a jealous care over the assertion and maintenance of the regalias against the assumptions of the curia the first appointment he had occasion to make was that of felipe bertran bishop of salamanca after the death of inquisitor general boniface december twenty seventh seventeen seventy four was dispatched the application to the papacy for the commission carefully framed to avoid attributing to the latter any share in the selection or appointment and merely asking for a delegation of faculties accompanied with instructions to the ambassador flori de blanca to procure for bertrand a dispensation from residence at his see during his term of office clement the fourteenth had died september twenty second seventeen seventy four and the intrigues arising from the suppression of the jesuits delayed the election of pius the sixth until february fifteenth seventeen seventy five but on february twenty seventh the commission and dispensation were signed march twenty fifth carlos sent the commission to the royal camara for examination before its delivery to bertran and the camara reported april twenty fourth that its fiscal pronounced it similar to that granted to boniface in seventeen fifty five but that it did not express as it should the royal nomination and had the form of a motu proprio he also objected to its granting the power of appointment and further that some of the faculties included infringed on the royal and episcopal jurisdictions while the clauses on censorship conflicted with the royal decrees under these reserves the brief was ordered to be delivered to bertrand whether or not a protest was made to the curia does not appear but if it was it was ineffective for the same formula was used in the commission issued to inquisitor general agustin rubin de ceballos february seventeenth seventeen eighty four it may be assumed as a matter of course that the king had no power to dismiss an inquisitor general who held his commission at the pleasure of the pope but the sovereign had usually abundant means of enforcing a resignation whether that of alfonso suarez de fuentesas in fifteen o four was voluntary or coerced is not known but the case of cardinal manrique the successor of adrian shows that if an inquisitor general was not forced to resign he could be virtually shelved manrique as bishop of Badajoz, after isabella's death had so actively supported the claims of philip i that ferdinand ordered his arrest he fled to flanders where he entered charles's service and returned with him to spain obtaining the see of cordoba and ultimately the archbishopric of seville perhaps he incurred the ill-will of the empress isabella soon after his appointment for we find him complaining january twenty third fifteen twenty four to charles that when in valencia he had ordered the disarmament of the familiars and the arrest of Miser artes a salaried official of the inquisition violations of its privileges for which he asked a remedy in fifteen twenty nine he gave more serious cause of offence when charles sailed july twenty eighth to italy for his coronation he placed under charge of the empress doña luisa de acuna heiress of the count of valencia until her marriage could be determined there were three suitors manrique's cousin the count of trevino heir apparent of the duke of najera the marquis of astorga and the marquis of mayorga the empress placed her ward in the convent of san domingo el real of toledo where manrique abused his authority by introducing his cousin an altar had been prepared in advance 
and the marriage was celebrated on the spot. The empress, justly incensed, ordered him from the court to his see until the emperor could return and turned a deaf ear to the representations by the Suprema, December 12th, of the interference with the holy work of the Inquisition and the discredit cast upon it. It was probably to this that may be referred the delay in his elevation to the cardinalate, announced March 22, 1531, after being kept in peto since December 19, 1529. On Charles's return in 1533, he was allowed to take his place again, but he fell into disgrace once more in 1534, when he was sent back to his see, where he died at an advanced age in 1538. Still, this was not equivalent to dismissal. He continued to exercise his functions, and his signature was appended to documents of the Inquisition at least until 1537. Yet while thus dealing with the Inquisitor-General, the Crown could exercise no control over the tribunals. The Empress was interested in the case of Fray Francisco Ortiz, arrested April sixth, 1529, by the Tribunal of Toledo, and she twice requested the expediting of his trial for which, October twenty seventh, 1530, she alleged reasons of state, but the Tribunal was deaf to her wishes, as well as to those of Clement the Seventh, who interposed July first, fifteen thirty one, and the sentence was not rendered until April seventeenth, fifteen thirty two. There was no occasion for a royal interference with Inquisitors General Tavera, Loisa, or Valdez. If the latter was forced to resign in fifteen sixty six, it was not by order of Philip the Second, but of Pius V for his part, as we shall see hereafter in the persecution of Carranza, Archbishop of Toledo. So, if Espinosa, in 1572, died in consequence of a reproof from Philip II, it was not for official misconduct, and merely shows the depth of servility attainable by the courtiers of the period. The reign of the feeble Philip III, however, afforded several instances that the royal will sufficed to create vacancy, he had scarce mounted on the throne as a youth of twenty on the death of Philip the Second, September thirteenth, fifteen ninety eight, before he sought to get rid of Inquisitor General Porto Carrero, who had, it is said, spoken lightly of him, or had incurred the ill will of the favorite, the Duke of Lerma. To effect this, a bull was procured from Clement the Eighth, requiring episcopal residence. Porto Carrero was Bishop of Suenca, a see reputed to be worth 50,000 ducats a year, but he preferred to abandon this and make fruitless efforts at Rome to be permitted to do so. He left Madrid in September 1599, for Suenca had died of grief within a twelve-month, refusing to make a will because, as he said, he had nothing to leave but debts that would take two years' revenue of his see to pay. His successor, Cardinal Fernando Nino de Guevara, fared no better. He was in Rome at the time of his appointment, but did not take possession of his office until December 23, 1599. But already, in May 1600, there were rumors that he was to be superseded by Sandoval y Rojas, Archbishop of Toledo. Yet, in 1601, he was made Archbishop of Seville, and he sought to purchase Philip's favor by a gift of 40,000 ducats and nearly all his plate. This was unavailing, and in January 1602, he was ordered to reside in his see when he dutifully handed in his resignation. Juan de Zuniga, who succeeded, had a clause in his commission permitting him to resign the administration of his see in the hands of the Pope, but the precaution was superfluous, for he died December twentieth, sixteen o two, after only six weeks enjoyment of the office, for which he had sacrificed thirty thousand ducats a year from his see. He was old and feeble, and his death was attributed to his coming in winter from a warm climate to the rigors of Valladolid, then the residence of the court. The question of non residence was happily solved, for a time at least, by selecting as the next incumbent 
Juan Bautista de Azevedo, Bishop of Valladolid, the seat of the court. He was a person of so little consequence that the appointment aroused general surprise until it was recalled that he had been a secretary of Lerma. When the court removed to Madrid in 1606, he was obliged to choose between the two dignities, and his resignation of the bishopric was facilitated by granting him a pension of 12,000 ducats on the treasury of the Indies, besides which, as patriarch of the Indies, he had a salary of 8,000. His death soon followed, in 1608, when Sandoval y Rojas, the uncle of Lerma, obtained the position without sacrificing his primatial see of Toledo, a dispensation for non-residents being doubtless easily obtained by such a personage. Sandoval was succeeded in 1619 by Fray Luis de Aliaga, a Dominican who had been Lerma's confessor. In 1608, Lerma transferred him to the king, over whom his influence steadily increased. Although his doubtful reputation is inferable from the popular attribution to him of the spurious continuation of Don Quixote, published in 1614 under the name of Avallaneda, a work of which the buffoonery and indecency are most unclerical. Though he owed his fortune to Lerma, he joined in 1618 in causing his patron's downfall in favor of Lerma's nephew, the Duke of Useda, and during the rest of Philip's reign, Useda and Aliaga virtually ruled and misgoverned the land, filling the offices with their creatures, selling justice, and intensifying the financial disorders which were bringing Spain to its ruin. When Philip IV succeeded to the throne, March 31, 1621, under tutelage to his favorite Olivares, their first business was to dismiss all who had been in power under the late king. The secular officials were easily disposed of, but the papal commission of the inquisitor general rendered him independent of the king. He did not manifest the accommodating disposition of the Porto Carrero and Gavera, and, as he was not bishop, he could not be ordered to his see. It illustrates the anomalous position of the Inquisition as part of an absolute government, that for some weeks the question of his removal was the subject of repeated juntas and consultations. But finally, April 23rd, Philip wrote, ordering him to leave the court within 24 hours for the Dominican convent of Huete, where his superior would give him further instructions. He obeyed, but he refused the bishopric of Zamora and the countenance of his ecclesiastical revenues as the price of his resignation. The only method left was to obtain from Gregory the Fifteenth the withdrawal of his delegated powers by representing his unworthiness, his guilty complicity with Useda and Osuna, and Philip the Third's reproach to him on his deathbed for misguiding his soul to perdition. Gregory listened favorably and Aliaga seems to have recognized the untenableness of his position and to have resigned, although no evidence of it exists. All we know is that André Pacheco, Bishop of Suenca, was appointed as his successor in February 1622, and took possession of the office in April. Even after this, Aliaga was an object of apprehension. In June 1623, he came to Hortolesa, which was within a league or two of Madrid. Immediately the court was in a flutter. The king had earnest consultations. His propinquity was regarded as dangerous, and he could not be allowed to return, as he had asked, to his native Aragon, which was in a chronically inflammable condition, while in Valencia his brother was archbishop. Nor could he be allowed to leave the kingdom, possessing as he did so intimate a knowledge of state secrets. There were messages and active correspondence, and finally he was allowed to settle in Guadalajara with ample means, where his remaining three years of life passed in obscurity. Llorente tells us that proceedings were commenced against him for propositions savoring of Lutheranism and materialism, which were discontinued after his death, a device doubtless adopted to keep him in retirement. End of Book 2, Chapter 1, Part 2